Kubernetes 1.35 is here with some major updates that directly impact how we manage resources, secure workloads, and schedule parts. The biggest news is in place update of pod resources graduating to journal availability. This is a feature the community has been waiting for. And in today's episode of Kubestruck, I am talking with Drew Hagen, Kubernetes 1.35 release lead, to understand what this release brings to the table and why it matters for production environments. Drew, welcome to Kubestruck. Let's dive right in. What are the biggest updates in Kubernetes 1.35 that enterprises should pay attention to? Yeah, happy to be here. I'm really excited uh, to share some of the new features uh, that are enterprise ready. Uh, Kubernetes 135 has um, a lot of work that's been put in by our resilient community, including um, plenty of new enhancements around uh, smarter scheduling, more resilient scaling, and strong security boundaries. Um, for instance, uh, the scheduler has been improved to uh, take in a new workload object, which uh, can uh, group together different pods that could be scheduled um, either all together or not at all, which is a pretty strong use case for, uh, for AI, for example, where there's a bunch of different training jobs that are connecting to the same stateful data set. Um, for, for workloads like that, there's uh, a lot of distributed uh, computation that works all together. So um, it could be really important to have those dependencies up all together. We also have uh, numerical comparisons and taints and tolerations, which allows for creating more of a scoring system around uh, how pods will get uh, scheduled to different nodes. So for instance, you could have uh, spot instances and on-demand instances and give them different rating scores depending on uh, how um, how continuous you need your workflow to be. Uh, another really great use case for AI and um, edge computing as well. Uh, so <clears throat> we, we have node uh, declaring features. So sometimes nodes can have a lot of different drift, like different underlining operating systems. So uh, now the nodes can declare what Kubernetes features that they support. And uh, we also have opportunistic batch scheduling, which allows for making some of the same scheduling decisions for jobs that are similar to one another. Um, we have more resilient scaling uh, for adjusting pods without downtime. So now we can uh, make adjustments to the limits and requests on jobs or on pods without uh, having to completely uh, take down the pod and bring it back up, which is amazing. Uh, so that allow, unlocks the ability to vertically scale, adjusting CPU and memory in place without having to restart that pod. Uh, again, very powerful for the AI use case where you will have a training job that needs to be up consistently for a long period of time. Um, for security, we have far better boundaries that are set in place. Um, a user namespace, so um, you can actually start up a pod uh, for w one specific user ID without elevating the permissions to uh, root on the host. Uh, there's <clears throat> there's uh, node impersonation a better node impersonation model that um, prevents the um, security hazard of joining in a machine into the cluster and then uh, impersonating itself as a node and pulling um, sensitive information from the pods. Uh, there's better uh, pods uh, certifications, uh, MTLS uh, certifications for each pod to better identify it and allow for secure end-to-end uh, -end communication. And then there's, uh, um, there's a new feature to make sure that pods are authenticated to pull um, container images from the cache on a node. So um, that way uh, there's not going to be, um, there's not going to be a pod that's pulling uh, a container, a sensitive container image um, that it's not authorized to run. 
So um, those are a bunch of features that I'm really excited about. Um, yeah, and, and in addition, uh, for edge computing, there's a new uh, there's a new feature for attaching a volume of read-only data as an OCI artifact, which is really powerful for um, packaging a bunch of data together and um, and uh, attaching it. Anything else? Any other features that you're excited about? Yeah, I think there are two more things. One one I wanted to bring up was the um, some of the tech deck cleanup that the community is doing. I think it's pretty noteworthy for operators to uh, check out their cluster and see if there's um, any um, any of these uh, deprecations that they would want to adjust. So um, for one, we are phasing out the uh, support for uh, C groups v1. Uh, so any um, hosts on any hosts running on nodes that have the C groups v1 will want to um, upgrade to an OS that supports C groups v2. Um, we're also deprecating I, IPVS in uh, Cube Proxy. That has served us really well for a long time, but we're prioritizing the um, other capabilities like NF uh, NF tables, uh, which has more modern support. And uh, next release will be removing the Containerd uh, 1.x. So um, this is the last. This feature is the last call where that will be supported. Um, definitely recommend upgrading to Containerd. Uh, 2.x. Um, the last thing I wanted to bring up is a strong quality of life feature, and that's uh, KYAML. Uh, we have a new um, YAML format uh, exclusively for Kubernetes uh, that could be deployed to the cluster. And um, it's still valid YAML, uh, but it brings um, additional parsing of special characters such that the format is bringing over the best features of JSON. Things like square brackets for lists, curly braces for objects, and uh, double quoted keys to make the typing less ambiguous. Um, I think uh, what we've seen with YAML is that it's very um, heavily dependent on white space, uh, but bringing over uh, these changes in KYAML will make it much easier for uh, applications and operators to read and uh, parse and process. I have one final thing I could bring up. Um, that's like better observability. We we have a feature uh, kept forty eight twenty seven uh, for statuses uh, endpoint, and then also um, forty eight twenty eight for a flags endpoint. Uh, both are now in alpha, but um, these are capabilities for stronger observability. The statuses allows um, operators to observe a more rich JSON object on the status of pods. And um, we've rolled this out to support all of the uh, core components of Kubernetes. Um, so this will allow much more of a deep, uh, rich status on all the components. And you can set up custom status endpoints, just like the readiness or liveness endpoints. You can set up a status endpoints for new pods. Uh, flags is a new endpoint that allows uh, operators to observe the command line flags that are used at the startup of a pod, uh, quickly abstracting that up uh, to make it easier to dig into those without um, having to uh, attach into a pod and um, and uh, find that through logs. So um, we're really excited for these new capabilities and observability that are um, there native. Uh, again, I think there's uh, third party tools that operators may bring in uh, for these features, but it's really exciting uh, to have some of these things natively to simplify uh, the architecture of running a Kubernetes cluster. You mentioned a lot of key features and being a Kubernetes user yourself, which one are you personally most excited about and why does it matter for production workloads? Yeah, personally, I'm really excited about the scalability aspect of it. We um, just uh, we just released adjusting um, pod, uh, pod resources in place. Um, to stable and uh, that feature in particular, I'm really excited about being able to vertically scale uh, pods in place without having to restart a pod or application, I think is really powerful because we're moving into more, um, we're moving into a future that is demanding a lot more from our workloads that we're running on Kubernetes. Uh, 
a lot of times we can't accept downtime on some of these workloads that we're running. So I think it's going to be very powerful that we could dynamically adjust those resources um, without bringing down the application. Uh, that that will allow for a lot more resiliency and consistency uh, with our workloads. As you mentioned, this release also introduces native workload identity and automated certificate rotation. How does this change the way organizations handle service identity and authentication in Kubernetes clusters? This is a feature that will be very powerful for um, creating more native end-to-end -end, um, communication. Uh, previously, there were a lot of third-party uh, services that we'd have to deploy to a cluster to enable um, identification and, and secure uh, communication. Uh, things like uh, Spire and Insert Manager, but now that we have the capability to uh, have stronger identification and certification natively on the pods, um, that's going to uh, drastically simplify the architecture that operators are going to have to uh, have designed into their clusters. So we're really excited to roll out this feature and um, simplify things drastically for our operators. I noticed that Kubernetes 1.35 includes an alpha feature allowing nodes to declare their supported features before scheduling. What is the use case here and how does it improve cluster operations? Folks that are maintaining clusters on-prem or maybe in an edge computing environment, uh, there could be a lot of drift in, in the nodes, how they're configured, um, maybe different versions of the underlying operating system or even different hardware requirements. Uh, for example, there can be some nodes that are running with GPUs and can better handle AI workloads or um, maybe they're uh, attached directly to better storage volumes. Um, so node declaring features is very powerful for uh, giving the nodes uh, the chance to declare uh, the features that they will support so that when uh, pod, many different pods on the cluster are, are, are scheduled, they can find um, the nodes that are compatible for their needs. So that sort of prevents the um, landmine scheduling where a pod ends up getting uh, scheduled onto a node without the capabilities to uh, properly support that workload. Um, it also allows for um, making sure that the machines we have in the cluster are um, better fit for the actual workloads. Um, you wouldn't necessarily want to run a bunch of pods on a node that has an expensive GPU and then um, you're paying for all of that uptime. Uh, in, in this case, uh, deploying to um, deploying the applications that would be best suited to a GPU can get its um, best value there. And then other pods that don't necessarily need some of those hardware requirements can get ran on um, other nodes. So um, I think it's going to be a very powerful feature for operators in the modern day. Uh, this is something that has been in news cycle for a bit, the Ingress Nginx controller retirement. This is going to impact a lot of users. What can you tell us about this decision and what should teams who are affected should do next? I'll note that uh, this deprecation isn't actually a part of the 135 release, but it is something I'm personally very interested in as I'm also a Kubernetes user and have used the Nginx um, Ingress controller for a very long time. Um, I, I feel we've got a lot of really great use out of it as a community and, um, and you know, from end users. Um, but I think this raises a really uh, strong point about sustainability and open source. If we uh, don't have enough maintainers to support a particular component like this, it um, simply won't be viable for us to safely continue uh, maintaining it. So um, I'm really excited that we still have some really so uh, really strong solutions in the community. Um, for example, the Gateway API. So I would recommend that any users that um, need to find a similar solution look very closely at the Gateway API. Now, every Kubernetes release comes with a theme. What theme did you choose for this release and what is the story behind it? Yeah, uh, the theme the theme is something uh, we've put a lot of work into. Uh, 
It's uh, the release name is called Timbernetes. And uh, Timbernetes uses the world tree as a metaphor for Kubernetes as a global living system. It's inspired by the tree of life, uh, Yggdrasil, from Norse mythology. And it honors the resilience and di uh, diversity of contributors around the world who sustain the project alongside their day jobs, the, um, supporting their families, life challenges. Uh, the theme reflects where Kubernetes is today, is today, reinforcing the core of the platform, uh, setting deeper roots around security and stability, and setting itself up to be the foundation for uh, advanced workloads like AI going into the future. Um, it expands its branches to support many new uh, demanding workloads, and it continues to be the narrative of resilience and momentum from prior res uh, releases. So um, we really wanted to highlight a project that is maturing thoughtfully while continuing to grow. So a tree was the perfect um, metaphor for that. Um, in the logo, we also have some fun squirrels that um, are living at the tree, and uh, we had a lot of fun with giving them RPG uh, roles that also represent different release activities. You have the uh, rogue uh, triager squirrel that um, goes deep into different issues and triages them to the right special interest groups. You've got the uh, tech wizard squirrel that has a scroll that says, looks good to me and uh, is reviewing all the PRs. And then there's the branch manager warrior that is cutting uh, new versions of Kubernetes off of the tree. So um, we wanted to create something that was fun, but also very symbolic. Thank you so much for joining me and walking us through Kubernetes 1.35, whether it's in place pod updates to native workloads identity, and of course the Nginx controller transition. This release brings significant changes that production teams need to understand. Thanks for explaining all those, and I look forward to our next discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. And for those watching, if you are running Kubernetes production, make sure to check out the official Kubernetes 1.35 release notes and start planning your upgrade path now. And don't forget to subscribe to TFR, like this video, and share it with your teams. Thanks for watching.